A very good morning to all of you and welcome to the world's principled leader series that's brought to you by the Stephen R. Covey Leadership Center at the John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. We're so, so pleased to have you join us. I'm very pleased also to have my co-professor, Lord Dr. Michael Hastings, a member of the House of Lords and the British Parliament join us as well. He's with us from the UK. And it's our great pleasure to welcome our special guest today, Horst Schulze, the co-founder and former president of the Ritz Carlton, Carlton Hotel Company and the founder of the Capella Hotel Group. We're so pleased and honored to have you join us, Horst. Thank you very much. Nice to Thank be with you. I look forward. Thank you so much. And it's so good to see you again. It's been many years. Yeah. Yes. So we'd love to begin by allowing you, please, to share your story from your boyhood to the founding of the Ritz-Carlton. And then once you've shared your story, we'd love to dive into some questions that Lord Hastings and I have for you. We're so pleased that our students are here with us. They're the main point of this. We're all studying how to become more powerful, principled leaders. And we're studying the works of Dr. Stephen R. Covey. So welcome, Horst, and please share with us your story. First of all, it, 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 it will be a little lengthy, so let me, because it has, I think it has meaning. But first of all, uh, you know, when I was uh, when I started Ritz Carlton Hotel Company, I was a founder. Uh, I, was, I started this company when we had no hotels. Uh, and uh, after about 20 years, I left and it was the leading hotel company in the world. But what we did in very early, we adopted the, the, the Covey principles. Every, there wasn't a department head who was not taught the Covey principles. And, and I personally became friend with uh, Stephen. And it's because of him I wrote my book, by the way. Mm. Because he called me one day, he had he told me many times you should write your book. And in his typical way, one I drove home one evening uh, in the car and I answered the telephone and it was Stephen and he said, Horst, I am disappointed in you. <laughs> you still haven't written the book. And you are old and so on. And he gave me a lecture. And I said, yes, absolutely. As I had said every time before, absolutely, Stephen. I will, I'm, I'm looking at it and so on. And I didn't. And then Steve, when Stephen passed away, I had a bad conscience. And I sat down and did the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure Stephen is looking down and is very pleased yeah to see that the book has been written and you fulfilled your promise. Yeah, yeah, so going back to my background and I, 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 it's, I think it, it, it is, was of course pertinent to who I am. And obviously we all are the impact, the influence of people that we meet in our lives, what we learn from in our lives. Unfortunately, we learn sometimes from the wrong people, but we are the impact of that. And my life was simply, I wanted to work in the hotel business. Uh, that was not uh, what you did in Germany at the time from a small village. You went into a technical job. It would have been honorable to be a butcher, a roofer, uh, of course, architect or, or engineer. Now that would have been something that would have created honor to the family. Instead, I wondered and begged and cried. And so my parents looked for the best hotel in the region, got a job there as a busboy. Unfortunately, it was 100 kilom kilometers away from home. It was far at that time, believe me, that was in 1954. That was very far. So I got a job there, so my mother took me there. It was the best hotel in the region, of course, before we got there, I was admonished for days and weeks now that we have that job, it's the best hotel, only ladies and gentlemen, very fine people go there. Now. And this we could never go there. Now behave yourself accordingly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Typical parents. When I got there, the general manager told us, my mother and I, literally, now you learn to be a servant to fine ladies and gentlemen. Don't be, be envious. Don't get jealous. You are understand. They are very fine ladies and gentlemen. You are a servant, literally. The next day. And my mother then left, I took her to the railroad station, left, I cried myself to sleep. Uh, and uh, the next time I meet the maitre d', that's the man I reported to. And he said, the first thing now, I want you to get ready with all your clothing and everything. 
living in a dorm room with four other kids under the roof of the hotel. And, but tomorrow morning, show up at seven o'clock, probably dressed, but don't come to work. Come here to be excellent in what you're doing. And I went over my head, 14 years old, excellent in washing dishes, that's what he did. Uh, cleaning floors, cleaning ashtrays, that was an advanced position cleaning ashtray in front of the guest, but Washington, so what's excellent about it? So I started and went on and in typical German upbringing, you, once a week you go to school, trade school, the kids from the region that work in hotels, restaurants come there. And then there are other six days you work. <laughs> that was 1954, mind you. So working very hard and, and after two years, I have learned what more and more what excellence is because that Maitre D was a human being of excellence. He defined himself as a person of excellence. He would have never ended a restaurant and looked, looked perfect and everything was perfect. And his teaching, his attention to us, the young kids and so on. Now, two years in, I got to school that day and the teacher asked us to write an essay now, what we now think about our business. Our, now that we're two years in it, going back to work, I worked in a, a factual evening, can feel it still. I was working, working in the corner with my back to the entrance when I could feel the matter that he had entered the room. Literally could feel it. Mm. And I see him turn around, see him approaching a table. <clears throat> and I saw that the guests that, that he approached were proud that he came to them. Wait a minute, we are the servants. There was a reversal. I could see a reversal here. That was stunning to me. And I paid attention. I realized all guests in the room think that he is the most important person, person in the room. So did we, the employees. When I contemplated that night read, writing my essay, three pages, I realized that he defined himself as the finest person in the room. He defined himself as a person of excellence. For the first time, I really realized that, understood that. And for the first time, I realized I can do that. If I can, define, if I can be excellent in what I'm doing and define myself with it, wow, I define myself. And so I wrote an essay which I named, We Are Ladies and Gentlemen, Serving Ladies and Gentlemen. We're not servants unless we define ourselves as such. Mm -hmm and doing excellent what they're doing. And it, that remind me so much of the Martin Luther statement later. So I, I le left from there, worked in the finest hotels in Europe, including the, the Bourbash Palace in, in Lausanne, the Belleville Palace in Bern, the, the Plaza Arden in Paris, the Claridge's and the Savoy and the Barclay in London. And from there came the United States. And now I have worked now several years in Europe and come to the United States for a year or two. I worked first in the, the Hilton in San Francisco. And this is pertinent to the young people. I hope you can hear me. I worked in the, in the Hilton San Francisco with the intention to go back to, to Europe within about two years. But I wanted first to have a promotion to room service supervisor. I could see this was quite easily possible because they moved a lot. And I knew I was the best waiter there. They didn't know all the, all the details about food and, and beverage as I had learned in my career in Europe. And I knew I would get a job because not only being the best waiter, the manager in room service was German too. So I had an in, it was clear. That was my job, the next one. And sure enough, they became available, except I didn't get it. Another waiter got it. I had to overcome my ego, my, my, my thinking how stupid management is and so on, the typical thoughts that go through one's mind, negative. It took me three months to get over it and admit slowly, the other guy deserved it more. The other guy didn't come to work five minutes late in the morning. I did once in a while. The other guy, when, when there was side work to be done and was told and we were asked, do the side work. I said, by me. He didn't. He just said, I'm happy to. And I contemplated that. And I went back to my small 
furnished room in the worst street at the time in, in San Francisco. And I talked to my old maitre d. Now he had passed away in the meantime, he wasn't there. And he didn't show up as a spirit, no. But I talked with him and I said, forgive me. Before I left, I made, you made me promise that I would go to work for excellence. You taught me, you told me a million times, but I went to work for work and not for excellence. And I promised him that and I absolutely promised him that I dare, this will never ever happen again. I will manage so that I will go to work every day for excellence. I wrote it on the mirror where I shaved in the morning. I managed myself and I went to work five minutes early, not five minutes late. And I smiled when I walked in. Before you could see from a hundred meters that I was tired because I went out the night before. <laughs> I managed, I managed. From there on, I created excellence and the career took off, off like a rocket ship from there. And to the point where when, when we were running, I, I, to the point where I was running all, all operations, food and beverage for the United States for Hyatt, where I became done, was offered to start a new hotel company. I started it, created the finest in the world, not my words. When I retired from Ritz Carlton after 20 years, started another hotel company, Capella, which incidentally recently was voted the finest hotel company in the world, mm -hmm. and the hotel in Bali, best hotel in the world. All with, with a simple philosophy of creating excellence when you work and not just going to work. So that's a, the, 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 the beginning background to, to this, to the point of day in a way, in a short work. But it was that commitment. It is, it is all, I, I think all, everything in life is a decision. I, don't say, I think your destiny is the results of the decisions that you make in your life. And excellence, by the way, is never an accident. It's always the result of high intent and hard work. Hmm. Hmm. Well, Horst, it sounds like this maitre d had a profound impact on your life, both in terms of his own personal modeling yeah. and as also the way he conveyed this to you. Clearly, and, and of course, a, a, a huge impact in my life, I mean, Totally. And, and the fact that my SA got an A, the only one I ever had before and after, also helped. <laughs> so, so, but it, it impacted me. But here's a, a huge impact. And of course, there were others in, in my life throughout my career that impacted me in a positive way. And that is really when, when I, when he was a manager. But for me, the greatest gift, the greatest responsibility at a time, sometime as a manager or a leader is simply to positively impact the people that you're connect, connected to. Mm -hmm. it, that is why being a teacher of, in, teacher in, in work or, or in a classroom doesn't matter. It's the greatest honor that you have because you actually have the opportunity to have a, a positive impact in human beings' life, not only in their job, but in the life, and he had it in my life. I, I applied the same philosophy in my marriage. Hmm. Make a decision for excellence. When I got married, I made a decision, I will be in love for the rest of my life. Hmm. And I discussed with my wife, and I married 42 years, and I don't only love my wife, I am in love with my wife. Hmm. That's my decision. That's my decision. And I don't let the feelings, we don't feel like it anymore, manage me, but I let my decisions manage me. I don't let my, my, my feelings of not liking somebody for a moment manage me and make the decision that we should like and should love. So powerful, Horst. Thank you for applying this and sharing it, how it connects to your marriage and your family. Uh, I'd also be very interested to have you share, you know, as you're amidst this rocket ship ride in your career, mm -hmm. uh, what led to the shift to start something new? Would you tell <laughs> us the birth of, the, and why you would lead such a great opportunity in a career to start something new with great risk? You know, by that time, because of the name, not because of me, but because of the name of Ritz Carlton, I was kind of 
that, that, that the star in the industry and everybody knew me because of it. The name Ritz Carlton was there and everybody had a look who was running this company, so I was there. Uh, but, but at the same time, my, uh, it is not, it, it's not, please forgive me, there was, a, there's a house from around. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't even know it was connected anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding you. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, it, it will, it will come to an end. Good. Oh, wow. Uh, so please, please forgive me. I'm sorry. So anyway, uh, there came a time where the painting was painted. It was very clear. It, I, I couldn't. I couldn't add any more to it. I couldn't create any more. It, it was settled. What was I could double around with it. Put a little bit more paint here, a little more paint there. But the thing was painted, and it was so. And of course, I was traveling, uh, traveling two hundred fifty days a year. Mm -hmm. um, hotels in Europe, in Asia, everywhere. And and by the way, by the way, every one of the hotels at the time was voted number one in their market segment. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, but I, you had to be personally there, they personally collect, connected. In fact, I made it a point to open every Ritz Carlton myself, everything the new or any takeover, to open myself, do the first orientation, what part of the training. So I spent an unbelievable time, time away from home and my wife convinced me it's time to retire. It, it's just time. And, and so I, I, I accepted that and... Uh, with tears, but with anticipation left. And, uh, and uh, I, now, by the, by I announced to the industry, to the company on closed circuit at the time, we didn't have Zoom, that I was leaving and I read a little prayer my wife wrote uh, a week into starting the company. And everybody was convinced I wrote the week before because everything she wrote exactly happened. You know, it's, it's just <laughs> remarkable. And so, but then I was home on the weekend, my wife and kids picked me up uh, from the office the last day and, and, uh, and we left and, and tears in one hand, leaving wonderful people, wonderful company, uh, and a wonderful surrounding and wonderful recognition, ego, everything was there. And I drove home where, uh, where the happiest when they saw me was the dog. <laughs> 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 but it was great and I had a great weekend and on Monday I told my wife I will start one more time mm. and she declared me insane immediately <laughs> so, I said, well, but I could see what happened in the meantime the, the market shifted there, it was very clear that the market was shifting into ultra luxury and luxury in a global sense uh, what does that mean? I guess 25 years ago, if you would have said, what is a real luxury car? Nearly everybody would have said Mercedes. Today, the ultra luxury would probably say Bentley. Mm -hmm. And that was happening in everything. And, and I looked at that and, and I saw studies on that. And I said, wow, well, there are ultra luxury hotels for a long time. If, it, if you make the, take the Claridge's or the Plaza Atene or all those hotels that I mentioned but there was no ultra luxury hotel company. And I wanted to be the first one to create that. So I went, I started that Friday, then I retired for the weekend and on Monday I started again. <laughs> Talking office. And after a few days, my wife said, all right, that's who you are and support you, but don't make it too big. And I said, that, that kind of hotel company you cannot make big because there's not enough locations for it. So I went out and, and I knew it would be easier to start in Asia because the availability of money at the time. And so I started in Asia and uh, as I said, the hotel in, in, uh, in Bali was just four weeks ago. So I the best hotel company in the world and the company was voted number two in, in, the, in the American publication, but in the Asian publications, number one. So. Mm -hmm. It is there all built on the same philosophy of basically what you respect, respect for everybody, respect and understanding that the company is there and the vision of company is there to serve all concerned. And if as a leader, don't understand that you're not really a leader when you create a vision of your company. And if you don't have a vision, you're not a leader either. I mean, let's, let's make that clear. 
Oh, uh, my vision of, of course, Ritz Carlton was to create the best hotel company in the world. But as a leader, I had to ask myself and in fact, agonize, not just simple answers, agonize, is this good for all concerned? Is it good for the investors? Is it good for the, for the customer? Is it good for every employee? Is it good for society as a whole? I myself had to ask myself, and, and, and you don't have to do that. I'm, I'm just telling the, about myself here. I had a question, would God approve? And once the answer was yes, in all cases, I cannot compromise anymore. I had to build a company accordingly. Mm-hmm. It had to be good for all concerned. On every, every decision, and in, in, if you have a great organization, every major decision has to be, is this good for all concerned? Mm-hmm. Would this serve every, the society? Every employee is served by that. Every guest, is, every customer is, and of course, the investors. Mm-hmm. That, so that is, uh, uh, there's so much discussion today about what is leadership. Well, that's it. I mean, uh, if, you, if you question yourself, young people ask them, what is there? There's a discussion, what is management? What is leadership? If you look at your left, there are a lot of people there, hypothetically. <laughs> there may be none right now, but hypothetically on the left, there are a lot of people. And there are your customers and your potential customers. This is your market. On the right, there are a lot of people too. Those are your employees. And if you make sure that you understand clearly what does the market expect from my product? What is their expectation? Not mine. What is their expectation from the product? And then make sure every employee understands it. But in order to deliver it, management now creates processes, systems, controls, and measurements to make sure it actually happens. That's management. Mm-hmm. Leadership creates an environment which, in which the employees want to do it. Mm-hmm. And that is by making sure they have a sense of belonging and purpose. Mm-hmm. And, and that is so, so rare. And, 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 I, and it, that disturbs me in, in organizations. We don't hire people. And it really disturbs me. We don't hire people to be part of the organization, we hire people to fulfill a function. The chair on which you're sitting is fulfilling a function, mm-hmm. but we're dealing with human beings. And instead of going out and hiring human beings to become part of the purpose and the, and, and, and the motives of the organization, so they get what Aristotle said already, fulfillment in life by having purpose and belonging. Mm. We go out and say, fulfill a function, no different than the computer and everything else. And, and, and that cannot happen. We have to give people purpose. That cannot happen anymore. That means we have still our one foot in Taylorism, which means we think and they do, which is a horrible thing. <laughs> and instead of saying, we are part of creating excellence together for a purpose and for motives that makes sense to all. If I'm connecting as a leader, every employee to the vision of the company in our case was very simple. In 10 years, we want to be the leading hotel company in the world. Wow, wait a minute, we don't have hotels yet. Yeah, but that's what we want. Join me for that purpose. And here's my, and here's my motive so that we can grow rapidly so that you have a chance to grow too, opportunity if we grow, so that we have the best customers, so you will have, have the right to serve the best customers in the world, so that we will have more income, so you will have more income, so we will be respected, so you will be respected. So we're connecting like a triangle, the motives to the employee together, looking at the vision of the organization where we all get it all. Mm-hmm. That should be the thinking of any organization. So let's back up, Horst, uh, back to the start of the Ritz Carlton Hotel Company. You were, if I remember right, you were working in Chicago in a hotel company. That's right. And so tell us about the start of the Ritz Carlton. What inspired you to go there? And really, what transformed into the start of new properties, new hotels? Well, I, I, I had a wonderful job in, in Chicago with Hyatt. And 65 hotels and charge of food and beverage. I'm a young star in the company, blah, blah, blah. Uh, have golden handcuffs. 
<laughs> everything, uh, Kim and insurances and all this stuff that you want to have. When somebody called me and said, we're starting a new hotel company, you were highly recommended to run that company. We are only investors and developers. I'm not interested, <laughs> no interest, hmm. no interest. But they called me a couple of times and I, I told them in fact, not to call me anymore. And I had a long conversation with my wife telling her what I would have done if I would have taken that job. Mm. I started dreaming about something. I had a vision. I would have great built this company to globally number one company in the blah, 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 blah. And, so, and I really had a long conversation with her. And she said, it seems that you're really interested. And I said, no, 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 I'm not interested. But I kept on talking about it. When I went to work and something happened with the person I directly reported to that was very questionable and difficult for me to take. And I came home depressed that I have to keep on reporting to that person. A very unethical thing happened there. And I, I, I was depressed when they called me again and said, why don't you just talk with us? Somebody else recommended me. So I, we talked, they told me that I could run my own operations. They're on the company that they, they have nothing to do with hotels. They don't know hotels. You can run the company, build it. I said, could I move it to the top of the market? We told you, you can run it. Oh, well, now I started really dreaming and the vision, the dream started to control me and I moved to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was, I took the job in late 82. And we had, they had two hotels in construction. One was being constructed as a, as a Holiday Inn, one as a Marriott. The buildings were finished, not the interior. When I came over and said, well, new, we may build a new brand, top market. We have to get different interior designing and so on. Mm -hmm. We did that. And in January 1984, we opened our first hotel. January 7, 84. And the second one ra rapidly in the same city, which is not strategically very smart, but <laughs> we were in the same city in, in April. And then, of course, the first four hotels, the ownership group owned, I was running the management company, a se separate company. Mm -hmm. And from there on, we became a management company. We didn't own any more hotels, but we built a name Investors came to us and said, we want to build a hotel. We would like you to put your name on, you become, you manage it. And slowly grew and became global, became first hotel we opened in Mexico, global hotel. And then Hong Kong, Singapore, Berlin, and so on. We were in five continents by the time I left yeah. and we were ordered everywhere, number one, where we were. And living by the philosophy of understanding the customer, caring for the customer, respecting the employees. I made it very clear to the employees, you're not, you're not, you're not servants. Mm -hmm. It became the motto, you are ladies and gentlemen. We, we learned, of course, uh, management, including Kavi's teaching. Kavi helped a lot to put our name out there. Uh, and there I watched one time a, a a, me a meeting that Kavi gave, a speech that Kavi gave in Minneapolis, in the arena in, in Minneapolis, 16,000 people. And I watched that, I watched it, and there he pulls out a little card and said, I was in this hotel, and he told this story about the hotel, and he said, I, I, you guys, you know, he did the obvious thing, stand up and show to north, through north, and everybody showed in the long, wrong direction. And he said, I learned one company that has a true north, and I was in this hotel, and he said, and I sit there in the lobby and there is a clean uh, maintenance man working on the curtain very high up on the window. When a lady approached with both arms full from the beach and that maintenance man went up and opened the door. Hmm. And he said, that amazed me. So I went to her, why did he do that? And he pulled out this card here and said, it says here, whatever you do, pay attention to the customer, no matter what you're doing, number one. And he kept on talking and I realized it's my card. And I <laughs> screamed loud, uh, Kavi, say Rich Carlton, say Rich Carlton, but he didn't. He, didn't. he kept on talking and took this card and showed the card. And this, this is a card which everybody had to ca ca carry in their pocket, which states our values and our, and 
and our creed and so on and our purpose. And so I wrote him a letter and said, why didn't you mention our name? If you, it should have been worthwhile to you because you were talking about us the whole time. And, he, and, he, and I got a call and said, when I come to Atlanta, could we have breakfast? I said, I would be delighted. <laughs> That's how I got to know him. That's how I came up out several times to talk in the round table with him and spoke to the group, as you well know. It's wonderful. You know, uh, you speak, Horst, of these three universals that you embedded into your, the culture of your company. These students are future business leaders. Would you share these three universals? I, I, I believe you, you refer to the expectation of the customer. Yeah. Yes, they, they are the customer. We, we, we must understand that no matter what, no matter what I sell no, and, or no matter going back, no matter what student, what you buy, it really doesn't matter what you buy, if it's a house, a car, a television, a new telephone, or, or a bottle of water. And I would like to use the bottle of water as simplicity. Let's say you buy a bottle of water. What's your expectation? Mm -hmm. You have a subconscious expectation that you want that bottle of water to be defect free. Mm -hmm. Any product you buy, you want to be defect free. Number two, you want it timely. You want it when you want it. You see, don't, you want it defect free. You don't want anything to swim in there. You don't want to stay there and wait for it. But you want it when you want it. So in very important elements here. And number three, you want the people who give it to you to be nice to you. Mm. That's the expectation. And guess what? So that being nice, which we refer to as service, that moment of interaction is the service moment of interaction. That is relationship. And that relationship piece really drives customer satisfaction and eventually loyalty more than the product. This is a fact. And people talk about it, but they're not doing anything about it. It is, and those people say, well, B2B, business to business. <laughs> There's still a human being in your business talking to a human being over here. And that's the decision. That's how the decision is made about your business. Mm -hmm. So to understand that, we had to teach that and create processes behind that. Mm -hmm. So that we, and in fact, we made it very clear that that interaction moment in our hotel must convince the guest to want to come back and want to recommend us. Mm -hmm. That in that moment of interaction. So we taught it. And, and that is a relationship thing, which we have to make sure in our selection of employees has to be part of the measurement. So mm -hmm. what, okay, what, I talked about excellence. What is a person of excellence? Let's look at that for a moment. Mm. A person of excellence is a person who does their very best in the functions that they fulfill. They, they're not perfect. They do their very best. Mm. If you study, you do your very best in that function. Number two, as a human being, or whatever it is you do, if you sweep streets, you do your very best in that function. But number two in the human being is not only the function, it's the relationship. You do your very best in your relationship. That comes back to the discussion about love. Mm. Love your neighbor as yourself. Mm. Guess, what? Guess what? Your employees are your neighbors too. <laughs> and, your, and, your, and, your, and your customers. So you do your very best in your relationship. And next, of course, as a human being, you do your very best in your morality. And hopefully next for me, again, I talk about me here, not about you, about everybody there. You do your very best virtually. <laughs> if you do your very best in all that, you talk about a human being of excellence. And, and so, so I have to make sure that, uh, that I get the very best in that relationship because the relationship thrives more than anything else. And if you do, if you do, if you're moral, you make sure your product is right. Put this all together because you're not sell, sell shoddy stuff to the customer. You do right for the customer and serve the customer. And serve, serve, service is used all the time too. Here's what service is. I'm sorry, I am, I'm, I'm rattling now. It gets, you, you, you know, I, I'm selling about that stuff, you know. <laughs> service starts the instant I make contact with the customer. In 
person in in relationship welcome not hi hi means we're equal if you say good morning sir welcome i'm saying i'm respecting you mm. you're important to me but at the same time i'm saying i am professional it's a two way conversation with everything i have with somebody mm. i'm establishing myself as i converse it's simple so service starts the instant my contact it continues now be with me here in any business if you have a shoe store no matter what you do in life service then continues to do the very best helping that person to make the right decision the very best for them it's about them not about us anymore it's a, it's not about me when the guest enters up it's about them caring for them showing them that we have a heart and care that comes from relationship you see the importance of relationship here and then finally in service it's farewell thank you for allowing me to serve you we were honored to serve you welcome comply farewell if i apply that in in the, with a the proper relationship and with a proper product i will have a winning organization no matter what i do i i advise and consult with a number of companies and we are blowing everybody away with that attitude I'm I'm working with a bank right now. We started with a couple of 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 branches. We now have 80 and we will be the leading financial organization in America. I make any bet because we follow those principles and other processes that support all that. Of course, there have to be processes to support everything. Of course, I don't know of anyone that Stephen loved to tell stories about more than his experiences in the Ritz Carlton. Yeah 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 I know. In fact, he got to the point where he he loved using these stories so much that when he would go and stay, he said I'm going to test the culture every time I go. No. In I other know. words, he'll 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 interrupt someone in the middle of the hallway just to see what they do and it's interesting I had my own experience once I had a business trip to Boston and I was going with a work colleague and i decided you know what i'm going to show my work colleague what a real culture is about so we we booked a room in the uh in the ritz carlton in boston and upon check in as i was going to my room i stopped the bellman and i said say my uh, colleague and i love a certain movie and it's the music man it's an old time musical and we were wanting to watch it in our room tonight. Do you know if there's any video rental place around this property that I could go find this uh this video to rent? And he said, "What's your room? I'll be back to you in just a few minutes." So we go and get settled in our room. 20 minutes later, I had expected a call with a location, but I get a knock on the door, and there is this bellman with a silver tray with the video cassette on the tray saying enjoy this movie Mr. Craig and here are some movie treats for you and here's the uh video cassette player uh have a wonderful time it totally i've told this story a hundred times yeah yeah so i understand that your employees were all empowered to spend up to $2000 to make a guest have an unforgettable experience how on earth do you trust employees from top to bottom including your housekeepers with that kind of judgment i i i have to, i boy i have to laugh just think about it for a moment because when uh, when i came out in a company and said here's what we're going to do we are going to empower we're not going to talk about empowerment we're going to empower we're going to empower every <laughs> every employee up to $2000 uh make a decision uh, i was in the vice president meeting they looked at me what do you mean every employee i said every employee well i mean let's be specific you don't mean bus boys i said read my lips every employee hmm. either we trust them or we don't either we respect them or we don't every employee and then we announced that it became a nuclear bomb i mean the owners of the hotels trying to sue me i'm telling you going to sue you you tell a bus boys to give 2000 dollars i said no i'm trying to convince the bus boys to keep our customers 
That's what I'm trying to do, to keep the customer, even if a negative moment happens, or if a good moment happens, or if, you, if they have a chance to, to create a memorable moment like they did with you. That means to become lifetime guest, and if they are in lifetime, the guest is a, has a value of two hundred thousand dollars. That's what I figured out. It was an economic decision and, and, a, and a trust decision. And at the same time, telling our employees we trust you or not put anything behind it. So we announced it, and that was oh, that the uproar. But <laughs> we taught them for two weeks how to deal with any complaint. And here's another reason. Look, no matter what business you're in, there are three types of customers. There is the dissatisfied customer. There is the satisfied customer and the loyal customer. Now the dissatisfied customer becomes a terrorist behind your organization. Mm -hmm. They go on the internet now and they, make, they can destroy you. How can we not want to move a dissatisfied customer to become a loyal customer? This is worth every effort to me. And so, but we taught that your role is to keep the customer, mm -hmm. even if there's a problem happens. Like I, I tell in my book, the story, and, 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 and I, can, I, I can tell thousands of interesting stories around that. Like the, the guest that comes in the morning for breakfast and the bus boy says, I hope you had a nice day. And he said, I didn't. There was a noise in the corridor and my TV didn't work. And if, and if the bus boy says, forgive me, sir, I'm so sorry. Wow. First, and then he said, I feel so bad, I buy your breakfast. That customer rather than terrorist becomes loyal. Mm. And that is the point. You know, the, the, the loyal, the, 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 the satisfied customer is not yours either. They go next door if they think there's a better deal. Mm. The satisfied customer stays loyal to you. No. It, this is very important. Hear me, please, young people. We know on a recent surveys that 70% of the market says, I am willing to pay more for the same product if I get good service. The same product. Now, here's something even more important. 80% of the millennials say that. Mm. And tomorrow's customer will be the millennial. So why am I not making sure? That, that I show, again, relationship, excellence and relationship, show that we care, even when something goes wrong, so that I create a loyal customer who is willing to pay more for my product, even if next door they get the same thing for less. Now, this, why, why is that? Why would I do that? Because by our accent, by this moment of the bus boy saying, please forgive me, not point to others. Mm. And by this moment said, in fact, I buy a breakfast. And then even be empowered in addition to send some fruit, some fruit basket or some cookies to the guy's room and says, I'm sorry. That customer becomes loyal. Why? Because they trust you. Mm -hmm. Loyalty is nothing else than I trust in you. And mm -hmm. we have to trust, create that trust, not with the product. Yes, if it consistently the product is excellence, you create tr trust too. I know that. I, I'm not saying create a lousy product in good relationship. I'm not saying that. The trap product that has to be right too. You cannot have a dirty room. I made sure my rooms are the cleanest in the industry. I guaranteed it. Yeah, there was no cleaner room, but the systems were in there. And that's what Kavi said. How do you make sure? I remember saying the, the room is clean always, totally clean. And I told him our system. And he said, you must write it down. You must. And then he called me again, you haven't written your book. Yet. Hey, are you writing? Yes, I do. And that time he said, you, I, I'm disappointed in you. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Lord Hastings, would you like to ask Horst a question? Yes, I do. Thank you so much, uh, Horst, for your time with us. And you've revealed so much of yourself and your life. I just want to take you way, way, way back and ask you, this this emphasis, this great emphasis on excellence, I'm assuming that somebody in your childhood modeled that to you. Well, well my, uh, I don't know if I could say my parents, they were very exacting mm. and that plays a role there too in excellence. They were very exacting. You couldn't leave mess around. 
You have to, have to finish what you eat and, and, and everything. You have to dress right, you have to go, and, and everything. But the Maitre D was talking about excellence all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and and he, he said, you, you did it, but tell me, here's how you did it. Tell me, is, that, is this done with excellence? Or when you, when you clean something, come back was not, and said, just tell me where there is excellence here. And he, in fact, he used the word excellence. He spoke several languages fluent. And, and so it was, and I was 14 years old. It was very impactful still. Mm. And it's, it's funny that then something happened. I worked in the American Embassy Club for, for a year in Bonn, Germany at the time, but Gottesburg. There was a, uh, there was a bartender who kind of took me on as a young man. I was 18 by that time. I started my first assistant uh, waiter job. And he could see from the bar, he could see all the restaurant. And I was staying there one day with both hands in my pocket. And he called me to the bar and he said, young man, tell me how professional excellence it was to stand there in the restaurant with two hands in your pocket. Uh, you're defining ourselves as a little bum and not as excellent. And <laughs> I forget that. <laughs> and, wow. and, he, and he kept on reminding me of excellence, coincidentally, unused coincidentally, the word excellence too. So it really stuck with me. And, and, and then I, I went into U Europe, as I said, and then I forgot to even think about it until that incident in San Francisco when I actually faced my maitre d again, again, he wasn't there, but I faced him. And I was embarrassed. I literally was embarrassed before him that I have totally ignored his teaching and acted and went to, go to, went to work rather than create excellence. And so it impacted me. So what this emotional moment of, of thinking, my goodness, yes, I, took it for granted to get this job and I blame others. I can only blame myself. I'm responsible for myself. I'm defining myself. Uh, all the things that the, that the Medity taught me and that Otto and the, the bartender taught me. And I was embarrassed. And I said, this will never happen again. Never ever. And, and, and I, 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 to the point, I said, I have any job I do have to do with such excellence that there's no question. To the point when I worked for Hyatt, I was director of food and beverage operation of a hotel. And the president called me and said, all right, we have a promotion for you, Horst. Thank you, you're doing a great job. You're wonderful. We have the right job for you. Your, your style and everything. We have the best hotel we think in the company as general manager in, in San Francisco and Union Square and, and uh, ideal for you. And, our, and it's a dream, the absolute dream to become general manager done of a great hotel. My goodness. And I said, no, I won't accept it. And he said, well, you're not going to leave the company. He said, no. And he was calling, our headquarters was in San Francisco at that time. He was calling me from there and he said, what's the matter? I said, I don't want to be a, a channel manager. I want to be a channel manager of excellence. And I never was a room manager. So please promote me to move me to rooms manager, which is a lateral move, rooms manager, so that I can become a channel manager of excellence. He said, but you don't know what need to. We give you a rooms good and rooms manager. I said, I won't do it. I won't do it. And, and he said, I don't get it. He said, make me rooms manager for one year and then give me the worst hotel in the company. He said, we have the best hotel in the company. Give me the worst. Give me the absolute worst, but make me a rooms manager first. And he did. He came to Chicago to talk to me one more time. I said, no, I won't take it. He made me rooms manager. But then a year later, he called me. He said, remember what you said? I said, uh, sure. I said, I want to be rooms manager first. No, no, no. He said, you said you want to take, get the worst hotel. We got it. And they gave me the worst hotel in the company. And it was great because I could create success with that one. Mm. The best one was, would have been difficult to show it. I went to Pittsburgh and created, and the next job was a lot. And the next job was a large Ritz Carlton. And the next job was regional vice president. And the next job was corporate vice president, all within nine years. Mm. Mm. I've just one more question for you, which is that um, you're very clear and outspoken about your faith and your yeah. love for God is very yeah. prominent. And you'll know 
that uh, one of the most beautiful descriptions of love is in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But the immediate verse before it in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31 says, I will show you a more excellent way, yeah. Yeah. which is the way of love. Yes. And how has your, your very vivid faith affected how you've done what you've done? Well, oh yeah, well, sure, it, it affects, sure, it affects, it, it, you have to let it, you have to allow it to affect, affect your life. Simple as that. Um, my, uh, it, it, by the way, my, my, um, my belief is a decision to, you see, hmm. uh, either we, we believe, all of us, we believe or don't believe, has, has a, was a decision. Either the decision evolves in you or it comes at once. My decision was a decision uh, for hope. My decision for, for life. I don't, it's very stupid for me to make a decision against hope. So I made a decision to believe. Uh, and then, of course, followed that decision. The longer I made the decision, the more I know I made the right decision. Clearly right decision. But it, of, course, of course it affects you. You have to question yourself in, in, the, in the whole philosophy of I'm here to, to help the life of every human being that's around me, which is a huge honor mm -hmm. and, that you have as a manager. But that, 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 was, that decision came out of, uh, out of the word of loving your neighbor as yourself. And again, it impacted me greatly. The very, the very when Jesus was created, as I know it's, it is it is earlier uh, that it, uh, stated in the Bible. But I mean, Jesus was asked, "What is, what is the number one commandment?" And I thought I was, I mean, if you let that go through your mind, how huge an, an answer that was to love you. Of course, love the God, but love your neighbor as yourself. Oh wow, I cannot do that. But wow, what a what an answer, what a question. And you have to kind of let it get, if you let it sink into you, you cannot help but apply it in your, in your leadership around you. And then if you realize that, if you realize I can, I can create an environment where the employees by respecting them. Now let's go back to the fiduciary role that we play as leaders and, and the selfish role. How can I apply this to, in, in a positive way for all concerned? If if my if the employees realize they're respected and honored, they will do. They will want to do the job. Consequently, I'm serving. I'm at the same time serving the investors and the customers. Hmm. So it, 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 I was very conscious about those decisions, very conscious about it, and I'm conscious about, frankly, mentioning it, hoping to help one or the other person. Hmm. Thank you, okay. Professor Craig. It was, it was in, in, in look, in, in, in a running Ritz Carlton, opening every hotel around. I made a, made a point in the opening. Uh, I didn't preach. I just say, uh, you, you can even call me. Well, how I'm going to put out my faith in Dubai and, mm -hmm. and, and, and so on. So I, I very simply said, <laughs> <laughs> okay, every employee can call me if you have a real problem. If you cannot have success in your hotel, you can call me. But don't call me Friday mornings because I go to Bible class. Mm. So, <laughs> so I <I'm laughs> made it known. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Thank uh, you. Uh, I have a final question for you. You've been very generous with your time. Thank you. Uh, tell us about when you learned that you had a rare form of cancer, hmm. that uh, you'd been told you have a short time to live. Could you tell, briefly tell us that story and then how that uh, yeah. impacted your, your life, your family and your work and your view of other people and of your role as a leader? Yeah, sure. I mean, if, if you had told, I can assure you, if you meet, have the moment in your life where you're told your illness uh, is fatal, it is terminal, you will have, get your stuff in order, you will have 10 months about uh, life changes. Uh, it impacts you. <laughs> I got, this is a significant emotional event which changes your life. No question. I was so, uh, I was at the height and, and was celebrated every event. And then, and then I was told, well, you have a very rare case of cancer. You have 
10 months, maybe a year. And uh, then I didn't accept it first. I went around to every, for many second opinions. And I want somebody to say, <laughs> it's not true, but they, they didn't, they said the same thing, all of them. The number one names and then I, as, as uh, Stephen knew that, I went on, didn't accept chemo or anything like that. Um, I went on my knees and I went on a diet, unusual diet, very, very difficult diet. I wanted to do something myself. I give him somebody in my arm to shoot in. Poison was not my decision. Uh, I'm, I'm not against it. Uh, my, my daughter has a serious cancer right now and she is, is on chemo. So, But anyway, I at that time, at that moment, when you're told that suddenly all the worldly stuff moves from you, your ego and all that stuff is gone, your ambitions, so everything's gone. So you, you suddenly, instead of having the thick veneer of the world, you, it's open and, and to, for, to let God in. And, and I, I will not bother you with that, but the experience that I have clarified for me God's present, uh, no, no, there was no doubt. And of course, those, those, those incidents shape you, you think about everybody looked, it's amazing how beautiful everybody looks. Mm. I, I, I was on a board, I had been a member 10 years and drove always to every once a month to that board meeting, up parked on the roof of the garage and walked from there right into offices. And now the first time I went to that board meeting, I realized there's a beautiful tree on top of the roof. I've never seen it before. I'd never seen it before because I was going on nothing but rushing. And all of a sudden you can see the beauty around us, the beauty about the, 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 the relationship of marriage, the, 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 the beauty about the world, the beauty about people, anybody, anybody. I don't put people in classes, in sections. They're all people to me, all. And when you have go through that, believe you me, you, you, you don't do that. So uh, it, was a, it was a totally life-changing event, dramatically, uh, in how to deal with anything. And, and uh, I, 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 I was, sometimes would hope that I would exact, go back to the same feelings in relation with God, by the way. Mm. Um, it should just you seek it and you cannot exactly find it but it was there were traumatic moments happen i tell a, a couple of them in the book uh that happened that's just <laughs> but it's very clear so uh, yeah it impacts it impacts uh, how you look at every employee and every employee that my goodness and that, that you, the enjoyment of being meeting somebody even for a moment and i and i and i, and I, I was kind of there before but i coined to me uh, then at that moment, st strongly, I got to work for two reasons. One is to create excellence, what I'm doing, and, and one to be with my friends, mm -hmm. all of them. If they wash dishes or what they do, they're my friends. That doesn't mean I barbecue with them, but I love them as my friends. And mm -hmm. I, I, that, that love is the minimum love I can master. I cannot quite master the love to love them as myself, but I can... Uh, Master the love to love them as my friends, my close friends, my dear friends, that I love them as human beings and honor the right to impact their life positively. Hmm. Thank well, you. It, it's, it's, uh, it's just huge to go through that. I, let me tell you something. Hmm. It, it, it's unbelievably huge. It, it cannot help but impact your life. Hmm. Horst, it was my great privilege to be invited by Stephen Covey to join him in his first meeting with you in the Buckhead property over breakfast. Yeah. And you had just won, either for the first or second time, the Malcolm Baldridge National first. Quality Award. First time. First time. And, and Stephen was congratulating you. And your response to the congratulations was, Stephen, we are the best but we're not even good. No, no. I said, we're the best of a lousy lot. That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> that we're not very good. This, this uh, made a deep impression. You are eternally committed to excellence and your model to the world is a great gift. Mm -hmm. It's a great yeah. gift to our students. 
And uh, we're deeply grateful to you. And we're grateful for your continued commitment to contribute. You know, Steve, one of the things that Stephen loved most to talk about in the last years of his life was the phrase, live life in crescendo. In other words, assume that your greatest and most important contributions and service are always ahead of you. Yeah. And, and to me, Horace, this is who you are. And so we, we give you our deepest thanks. Thank you. Boyd, I want to interrupt you. I want, to, I want to say one more thing to the students, but go ahead. I'm sorry. Please. No, please do. And then we'll wrap up. Please let me do that. I, I mean, I'm thinking about that once more here. This is so important and it, and it, it changed my life also. I told you what excellence is in, in, in a human being. If you take those pieces of excellence now, functioning, relationship, and morality, minimum, if you can, also spirituality. And take those and improve them continuously, just like you would improve continuously a company. You must improve yourself continuously. Mm. Otherwise, people will bypass you. This is, <laughs> this is terrible. You have to keep on learning, keep on studying and learning. But here is how you learn some of those things best. Ask question yourself after you went to functions. Ask yourself that in the evening that same day, could I have done it better? Hmm. And tweak. It's very simple. And if your relation in your relationship, every time you have relationship with anybody, say, could I have done this better? You see, in relationship, if you say one relationship is difficult, uh, I, ta I taught the Vedas when they're talking, taking order, that's a moment of relationship. Hmm. But if you say one word too much, you're obnoxious. If you say one word too little, you're not caring. So teach yourself as you turn around and say, how could I have done this better? Mm -hmm. And in everything, if you do that, you will improve content, ongoing, improving. No, no matter what, where you are today, you will be a leader in what you're doing. The, the one that improves the most will be the leader. That's simple. It's that simple. No matter where you are, if, if you improve because most people don't, coincidentally they improve, but not deliberately. But if you're deliberate, and teach yourself constantly. I question myself, not, not every day anymore, but every, every few weeks said, how could I have done better? After a podcast, I said, how could I have done this better? And tweak it. So, and, and I, I'm sorry, uh, and boy to go out and I hope, I, hope, I hope one of the, the students got that point. Wow, you will be successful. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry, it's sorry. Sure that's true. Well, thank you. And thank you all for joining us today in the world's principal leaders. We've had Horst Schultze with us, the founder and former president of the Ritz-Carlton Hotel Company and the Capella Hotel Company. It's been such a pleasure to have you with us. We also commend to you Horst's story and book found in Excellence Wins. It's a great read. We commend it to our students and all who are watching. We wish you, the, wish you the very best, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. I was honored, Lord Hastings, and, and, and boy, I was honored to be with you. 